My name is Bill Pendlebury, and I'm a former presenter at uh, Community Medical School, and it's my pleasure this evening to welcome you to the final lecture of the Fall Community Medical School series. Um, and I'm going to introduce our speaker, who is Dr. Robert Shapiro. Uh, the title of his presentation this evening is One Day at a Time When Headaches Become Chronic. Uh, let me just tell you a little bit about Dr. Shapiro. Um, he received a bunch of degrees from a lot of different places. <laughs> so that includes a bachelor's degree in biology and a master's degree in biology and a PhD in anatomy from the University of Pennsylvania, a bachelor's degree with honors and a master's degree in philosophy and psychology from the University of Oxford, and a, a medical degree from uh, Columbia University in New York. <clears throat> he completed his neurology training at um, Johns Hopkins and has been on the faculty at the University of Vermont since 1997, where he currently holds the rank of professor of neurological sciences. Um, I could spend his entire time telling you about Dr. Shapiro, but I'm not going to do that. I will just say that uh, he is an inter internationally known expert uh, in the area of diagnosis and treatment of headaches. Uh, he has published widely. Uh, he has been supported by numerous grants from the National Institute of Health and from the pharmaceutical industry. Um, and he's going to talk to you tonight, and I think it'll be an incredibly uh, enlightening and entertaining presentation. So this is going to be hopefully informative. Uh, it's going to be directed mostly towards the types of problems that uh, people who are in this area, who come to see me, the sorts of problems that they have, and so hopefully it'll be aligned towards what your interests and needs are. And it's about a problem that uh, is generally given a lot of short shrift within organized medicine, which is chronic headaches. Uh, when I was at, actually, no, when I was in medical school, I spent uh, a couple of months at a very famous hospital in London called the National Hospital for Neurological Disorders at Queen Square. And a very prominent neurologist there uh, named Nat Blau, this was back in the 19th century when I was there, Anyway, he was the most prominent doctor uh, who cared for headache disorders in Britain at the time. And he had all of these medical students and uh, doctors in training in this amphitheater, kind of like this one, only it was just very vertical. And they were all kind of looking down on him and had everybody chanting, a daily headache is not migraine. A daily headache is not migraine. It was like a mantra. And he had everyone chant this for about a minute. And if you chant something for about a minute, you remember it many years later. <laughs> and it took me over a decade to unlearn that mantra because a daily headache actually often is migraine. And it's often not appreciated that that's the case. So uh, my disclosure, I do a little bit of consulting, but not too much recently. So I'm going to be talking uh, about what is chronic headache, what are, what are chronic headaches, and what is chronic headache, uh, who gets them. I'm going to be talking largely about the continuum between chronic migraine and chronic tension type headache, which is largely what people experience and what brings people to see doctors like me. And I'm going to be giving kind of short shrift because of time to some of the rarer forms of chronic uh, daily headache. So about headaches in general, headaches are the dominant uh, condition which neurologists see, the most prevalent disorders. And this year, about half of Americans will experience some type of headache. Uh, about one in eight will experience uh, episodic migraine. And uh, about 4% will experience uh, chronic headaches or chronic migraine. And over the course of uh, a normal lifespan, about a third of Americans will experience episodic migraine. And it's about 43% of, uh, of women. So it's, this is not a rare set of conditions. This is actually part of the universal experience. Chronic headaches, though, is not so, not so common. But it really is a, a great source uh, that is a bad source of disability. So what, how do we define chronic uh, daily headache? The 
operative definition says that uh, someone needs to have headaches at least 15 days per month. And this needs to occur on at least three consecutive months. And there has to be no other uh, alternative uh, or secondary cause that can explain it. That is for a primary chronic daily headache disorder. And how do we approach this problem uh, as neurologists or headache specialists? Well, the first thing is a detailed history and examination because virtually all of the primary headache disorders have no what are called biomarkers. There's no clinical uh, test you can do with imaging studies. There's no blood tests. There's nothing that really will say that somebody has a, a, a disorder uh, on examination. So it's really the history that makes the difference. And these disorders are often called clinical disorders because uh, a primary care provider or a specialist provider needs to gather together the history and also the lack or absence of physical findings on examination to identify who has uh, which disorder. It's a very great misunderstanding about chronic migraine that people look like they're in pain. It's almost never the case that somebody who is in chronic who has chronic migraine or has a chronic daily headache disorder will actually show the types of pain behaviors that everyone associates with acute pain. When people stub their toe or burn their finger, they invariably will wince or cry or hold their, you know, hold the, the place that actually has the pain, in, the, in this case, the, uh, someone's head. But it's almost never the case that that's true for uh, chronic migraine or chronic daily headache. Uh, if you Google the term, uh, Google image the term migraine, you'll come up with a thousand images of people uh, with their eyes closed and holding their head. But that's not what it looks like. So what do we look for then in history and examination? We look for clues or cues that somebody has a secondary cause. And there are so-called red flags, things that are part of the history which don't say that there is a secondary cause, but gives people some alertness to think about whether or not secondary causes are there, things like is this the first time someone had had the headache, or is this the absolute most severe headache they've ever had? Has there been a significant change in the pattern? Is it associated with some other medical condition like cancer or AIDS or a new rash? Are there changes on the neurological examination? This is a very important thing to have a very accurate and, uh, and sensitive screening examination. Is it, is it triggered by straining or, uh, or coughing? Is it associated with pregnancies? This is not the complete list of things we look for, but this, is, you, this gives you a flavor of the sorts of things that uh, a, a doctor or a primary care provider would ask for to try to get a sense about whether or not other tests need to be done to try to look for a secondary cause. If they're not there, if those signs and symptoms aren't there, if the examinations prove to be negative or reassuring, then we make the diagnoses or we move to making the diagnoses of primary headache disorders. I'm not going to be talking about these secondary disorders tonight. So this is really focused on the primary headache disorders. So this is not a rare phenomenon. It's about 1 in 25 Americans will have chronic daily headache this year. And about 2 thirds of them are women. So we're talking somewhere in the neighborhood of 20,000 or so Vermonters have chronic daily headache. That's a remarkable thing, which means that if you get on a bus, a city bus, there's a reasonably good chance, assuming that these people are uh, as active as everybody else, that somebody who looks just like you or me, because I'm sure that a lot of people in this audience actually have chronic migraine, um, will have chronic migraine. There's no distinguishing feature that sets anyone apart. And this is actually both a, a helpful thing in some ways and obviously a, a, a harmful thing in some ways. So there are about 12 million Americans who will have chronic daily headache this year. And if you ask, how does it break down, about a third of them will have chronic migraine. And the other two thirds of them will have what's something, something called chronic tension type headache. Now what this means is that they may have this other disorder, chronic tension type headache, which I'll define momentarily, but they may also have episodic migraine. There's a difference between episodic and chronic, okay? But chronic migraine, it's about a third of people. Now, kind of superimposed on that, about 10% of this uh, 12 million people will have the onset of their daily or near daily headache disorder uh, as a relatively abrupt 
onset. We'll talk about this. This is called new daily persistent headache. And it's only really been identified in the last decade or so as, as potentially an independent new primary headache disorder, which may have migraine features with it. And we'll talk about that in a bit. And then I'll give uh, some lip service to uh, three of, actually could be multiply, uh, multiples of three, primary headache disorders, which can also appear on a daily basis. This is not to say that these are not um, extremely important and, uh, and disabling and actually very interesting uh, disorders, uh, certainly to anyone who has them. But from the public health point of view, they're much less prevalent than uh, this issue about migraine and tension type headache. So what is migraine? The first and most important thing, if you don't remember anything else, migraine is just not headache. Headache is a symptom of a condition of the nervous system that we call migraine. It's so fundamentally identified as being a headache that it's very difficult for people to separate the two. And headache is a symptom of that. You do not need to have headache to have migraine. There are many conditions, many situations where migraine presents itself without headache. Uh, it's kind of out of the scope to some extent of tonight's talk to, to discuss how that might happen, but it's very important to realize that it's a chronic episodic state of the brain and to some extent the nervous system generally. So this uh, brain state or migraine state, sometimes people call it the migraine brain, occurs in a predictable pattern. Okay, it occurs in attacks, and those attacks have a predictability about it. And the, the attacks are idiosyncratic. That is, each person who has migraine tends to have attacks which tend to be predictable and expected for them from one attack to the next. They don't remain stable and static, typically. So the way someone experiences their attacks when they're young or mid-age or late in life may vary tremendously. And when migraine becomes chronic or more frequent, it's very common for it to appear in multiple ways at different days. So someone who has 25 days with headaches per month consistent with migraine, it may appear one way in one day and a different way in another. And that may be a cause for a lot of confusion. Gee, do you have three disorders or, or 12 disorders? It typically doesn't appear in 12 different ways. But you can see how this may kind of morph into something which is a cause for, uh, for confusion. So who, who develops or has problems with migraine? Well, about half of the likelihood of developing migraine is due to the genes you receive from your parents. It's heritable. The rest of it is related to other factors, either internal factors, so hormonal changes uh, and the like, or external factors, such as the time of day, time of the year, things like that. But ultimately, this is a brain state that needs to be provoked. So people have a threshold and circumstances either internal or external or a combination kind of conspire to get to the point where people experience migraine because they cross that threshold into the point where they provoke an attack. There's kind of a tipping point, and everybody has that tipping point. Whether you are somebody who has migraine or not, it's my belief, and it's actually the mainstream view among headache doctors, that this is something which is probably part of the universal human condition to be able to experience this if the conditions were just so. So if you homogenize the experience of many people, say 1,000 people with migraine, and look for what is the typical attack, even though I just told you that everybody has their own individual attack, it kind of looks like this. So about a third of people will have a prolonged uh, set of symptoms, which may last hours to days. The average duration is around 18 hours or so. And these may be relatively nonspecific symptoms of moodiness or fatigue, sometimes abdominal symptoms or uh, muscle stiffness. Uh, often there's kind of un unusual food cravings or yawning. But again, this is quite individual as well. And then about 20 to 30 percent of people will have what we call an aura. An aura is a transient set of symptoms which are a reflection of this migraine state. And these symptoms have certain qualities which permit just based on the symptoms to say, uh, this is not likely to be a stroke, and it's not likely to be a seizure, and it's not likely to be anything else but migraine. And the characteristics which give us a clue, and again, they're not hard and fast and you know, invariant, but they tend to be sensory more than motor symptoms. They tend to be positive, meaning 
someone sees something rather than a loss of sensation or numbness. And they tend to be dynamic rather than static. So if you see a visual disturbance, it tends to move over time rather than stay in one place. And these, these symptoms can be visual. They can be a sensory dis disturbance. They can be changes in thinking or behavior. And then there's the headache phase. And the headache phase, it, it typically is not just headache. It has multiple components. And the headache is a prolonged event, four to 72 hours by convention. But combined with that is a strange and, and, uh, and extremely uh, dense sense that everything that you perceive is turned up and may be more likely to worsen the pain or may li more likely to, to lead to new symptoms. So light and sound, even relatively dim light like this, could be enough to make the headache worse or bring on new symptoms. Odors or touch, there's a condition we call allodynia in, in medicine, where even a light touch becomes painful. And if you imagine that we all have a, an ability to see, not see, perceive where we are in space, this is kind of a vestibular, a, a position sense that we all have, when that sense gets distorted, even a subtle movement can be over-exaggerated, and we get a sense that there's a false sense of movement or vertigo. And that's a very common symptom of migraine as well. And then on top of all of this, <clears throat> characteristically, there are what we call autonomic findings. So autonomic findings means that the brain has a lot of different tasks. And one of them is to actually provide executive control over the internal organs. And a lot of kind of uh, signals get crossed during migraine. So nausea and vomiting, and abdominal pain, and diarrhea, and, and nasal congestion, and tearing, all of these things are things that our body kind of does on automatic pilot, but during migraine, the brain kind of provides uh, misdirection, we think. And then there's a recovery phase, which often has symptoms quite similar to the prodromal phase. So if you map this out, it kind of has this sort of flow. There's a premonitory or prodrome phase. About a quarter of people will have the aura. And then there's this prolonged headache phase where the pain builds and people have sensitivities and autonomic changes and then it tends to resolve. And if you kind of focus on the aura phase, just because it tends to be the thing that is most riveting, this is a characteristic way that people describe aura of the infinite number of ways that people have described it. And this is actually the way I experience migraine aura. So when I experience it, it starts out as a little flickering in the middle of my visual field. And it spreads over really about 5, 10, 15 minutes into an arc. And the arc at its leading edge has this uh, fractal, colorful, geometric quality to it, which kind of shimmers. And it's hard to even focus on it. And as it widens, it tends to disappear outside of my field. And in its wake, it leaves an area of diminished of visual acuity. So it's not that I can't see, it's just that things seem a little dimmer and less uh, sharp. And as that resolves, I begin to develop a headache on the other side of my head. And this is a very common way for a migraine aura to occur. It's so common, in fact, that, that this kind of uh, zigzag pattern has been given the term fortification spectrum, kind of like the ramparts of a fort like Fort Ticonderoga. But there are many, many, many ways that this aura can appear. This particular description gives you an idea that it's sensory, so it's visual. It's positive in the sense that I can describe the features of it. It's not just an absence of, of vision. And it also moves, kind of the dynamic quality. People cannot sometimes have a tingling sensation, which kind of marches up the arm to the face. And then there are many other variants. The, so-called acephalgic is uh, when aura appears where there are no other symptoms at all, no headache, nothing. Hemiplegic is where there's a paralysis on one side during aura. It's very rare, but it's actually been very helpful and informative, helpful only in the, in the research sense, uh, in permitting us to identify at least three new genes for migraine because it's so unusual. People can have problems moving their eyes. They can have this aura on one eye rather than uh, in a part, one part of the visual field. Abdominal migraine is, is a 
abdominal pain or nausea, which can occur in isolation, typically in children. And there are a number of these types of syndromes. The Alice in Wonderland syndrome is typically in kids or adolescents, and they have this very uh, graphic description that things seem distorted in terms of their scale, and so everything looks much further than way than it should be. Probably if you can hold on to it, yeah, that would probably be best. So um, given all these clinical uh, signs and symptoms, how do you know when someone has migraine? Well, you know, uh, self-described experts have gathered in rooms to come up with criteria. And these are the current uh, accepted criteria for diagnosing migraine. It just gives you a flavor for how we go about this. Uh, these have been very helpful in ensuring that people who are entered into clinical trial studies to try to identify new therapies, all those people have migraines. So these are intended to be uh, more specific than sensitive. They may exclude people who have migraine, but at least the people who meet these criteria uh, we know do have migraines. You need to have at least five attacks. They need to be prolonged duration. The headache needs to have one, pardon me, at least two of the following four characteristics. On one side of the head, at least sometimes a pulsating or throbbing quality, at least sometimes, moderate to severe intensity of the pain, at least sometimes, and then worsened by routine movement or exercise or avoidance of that. So two of those four. And then accompanying the headache, at least one of either nausea or vomiting or photophobia or phonophobia, that is sensitivity to light or sensitivity to sound, and then not attributed to another disorder. For this to be chronic migraine, you need to have at least 15 days per month with headache, and at least eight days per month of those 15 have to meet these criteria for mi episodic migraine. And th that needs to be present for at least three months duration. So that's the operative definition for chronic migraine and migraine itself. So tension type, what is tension type? Tension type headache is a terrible name. It ought to be called headache number 51 or something like that, because there's no evidence whatsoever that it has to do with muscle tension or it has to do with any kind of psychic tension because you can't stand your boss. It has nothing to do with tension. It's like the unmigraine. If you take all the, the features of migraine which seem to distinguish it and you strip those away, you have a relatively nondescript, relatively shorter and less severe event which we call tension type headache because changing the name and taking the word tension out would have confused everybody. So this tends to be on, uh, present on both sides of the head, tends to be pressing rather than throbbing, it tends to be mild to moderate, it tends not to be aggravated, and it tends not to have associated features. This is also probably something that everybody will experience. It's uh, certainly in excess of 95% of people by the time they reach the age of 75 will have experienced this. This can also occur as a chronic form, as I mentioned. So that needs to be present at least 15 days per month. That is at least 180 days in a year for at least three months. The headache typically will last uh, uh, for a prolonged period of time. So how do we relate these two events? Because we're in a position where we don't have good enough detailed information about all the genes which might cause these or contribute to their cause, and we don't have biomarkers to tell, okay, it's this type versus that type. Well, the best evidence right now is that these are somehow joined at the hip or related or different sides of the coin to some extent. And the reason we think that is that people can have these very prominent episodes over here with aura and all of the other migraine features, and everyone is very clear that those are migraine. And they can have these very nondescript events, which I just described as tension type headache. But if you have these events, it's very common you also have these, and it's also very common that you have other events in the middle which are neither one nor the other. There's this kind of spectrum. And when people who have chronic migraine or a frequent migraine with these other headache events as well, when treatment is successful, it tends to kind of the tide lifting all boats. It's not just that the migraine events get better. All of the headache events tend to improve. So we tend to be more lumpers than splitters. We make these distinctions between these two. But from a practical point of view, it often doesn't make that much difference. It often doesn't make that much difference as well because drug companies are not developing new, more effective products for tension-type headache. And there's no, this is a, an editorial here, 
there's, there's no impetus from the standpoint of the National Institute of Health to spend much uh, funding money on research on headache disorders in general, and certainly not for tension type headache, because everyone, at least at the NIH, uh, would believe that tension type headache is something which take an aspirin or take something over the counter. It's actually much more than that. It's actually a source of tremendous disability under its, unto itself. But we don't know very much about tension diabetic, even though it's part of the universal condition. But we do think that there's a relationship to, to migraine. So if you ask who has frequent tension diabetic, so who has tension diabetic in the absence of migraine, okay, turns out that's very rare. So this is a, a study that was done looking at the frequency of tension type headache in people who have episodic migraine versus people who have no migraine at all. And over 180 days per year is 15 or more days per month. So this is chronic tension type headache. And you can see that people who have episodic migraine are four times more likely to have uh, chronic tension type headache than people who have no migraine at all. So this is a, another way of saying that we think these are related conditions. This non-migraineur population is about half of all people who are in the study. This is a population-based study, whereas episodic migraineurs are only about 12%. So even allowing for this change, it's still true that there are more people with chronic tension type headache than there, uh, who are without migraine than people who have, chron have chronic tension type headache who have episodic migraine. So migraine is way underdiagnosed and underappreciated, and it's misunderstood. So if you take those diagnostic criteria, which permit us to say who has migraine and who doesn't, and you ask, OK, in primary care waiting rooms in this country, if someone's coming to the doctor with a complaint of headaches, what kind of headache do they have? So there was a study done looking at consecutive patients in you know, uh, a large number of, uh, of primary care offices. And of the people who came in with nondescript recurrent headaches, 94% of them had migraine. Those who came in with sinus headache, this is what they believe. They had sinus congestion or drainage or midfacial tightness, where they were told they had sinus headache and they were where they had, had taken a decongestant and they thought that might have changed things and they thought they had sinus headache. Ninety percent of them had migraine. And people who came in with recurrent headaches, they came to their doctor for, for a complaint of headaches and they thought it was due to tension or stress. Ninety percent of them have migraine. So it sounds like everybody has migraine. You've got to remember that people often go to their doctors for, uh, for, for, uh, for headaches, but for people who don't have migraine, who have other kinds of headaches, they typically don't go to their doctor for that purpose. So these are all the people who meet the these diagnostic criteria I mentioned for migraine or probable migraine. So what is the impact of, of migraine versus uh, episodic versus chronic? Well, there's a a survey instrument called the My, uh, Migraine Disability Assessment Scale, or MIDAS. And it asks a, a number of questions about what the impact is of your headaches uh, uh, across a three-month span. And so they ask all right, how many days of, of work you missed, how, how, how many days you worked at a diminished capacity at your work, you know, your household uh, activities, missed time in, uh, in terms of social or leisure, and what you can see is that uh, the missed work, that is absenteeism, is almost five times, four to five times higher for people with chronic migraine versus episodic migraine. And likewise, the reduced productivity at work is about uh, maybe five to eight times higher. The cost for, uh, for headache in general in terms of lost labor productivity in this country is about $20 billion a year. And 80% of that is due to what we call presenteeism. Everyone understands what absenteeism is. You don't show up at work. But presenteeism is where the biggest deficit is. This is, this is uh, where people go to work, they punch the clock, they're trying, but they cannot work effectively. And the fact that they're is no physical finding on their exam. The fact that people look just like everybody else not only permits people to pass, but actually forces them to try to pass because they don't have any other choice. Uh, if they were to have uh, miss as many days as they need to miss, they would no longer be employable. So 
this is a huge and hidden issue, and it's actually not recognized. Now I'm getting into the editorial again. It's not recognized, for instance, by the Social Security Administration, even though the World Health Organization just came out with a study showing that of all neurological disorders uh, caused disability, okay, all, take all the neurological conditions combined and ask, okay, what percentage of disability is caused by migraine alone? It's over half of the global disability due to neurological disorders is caused by migraine. But the Social Security Administration doesn't have a particular listing which permits people to more readily obtain Social Security disability. And we're working to try to change that. So if you look at um, different groups of people who have episodic versus chronic migraine, and this is uh, zero to one day per month, two to three days per month, and so on, all the way until you get to this area, which is 15 to 18, 19 to 21, and you look at this migraine disability assessment scale, the blue is extreme disability. And you can see there's kind of an inflection point. It's not really at 15. It's closer to 12 days per month that people are tremendously impacted by this particular uh, condition. So much so that about one in five Americans who have chronic migraine, when polled, consider them themselves to be operationally, occupationally disabled, that they're not, unable to keep a job. And if you ask what percentage of people who have chronic migraine actually have, are maintaining full employment, it's only about a third. This is a profound condition which just doesn't get any press. So how do you go from every once in a while, episodic migraine to chronic migraine? What are the conditions that lead to that occurring? There was a study done with about 800 people who had on average uh, less than nine days with headaches per month, but at least had two days with headaches uh, per year. So these are people who are not this rare group of people who never have headaches. They have headaches, but they're relatively infrequent. And then they came back and asked a year later, had this changed at all? And 90%, 91% of them, there wasn't any progression. About 6% of them, they had gone from this uh, episodic to what we call frequent, frequent episodic. That's 9 to 14 days per month. And 3% of them had progressed to become chronic daily headache. So uh, questions um, started percolating. This was 10 years ago this study was published. Uh, and it was also true that people who had the frequent episodic were even more likely to move on to become cr uh, chronic daily headache. So the question is, what are the risk factors which put people in this position where it might progress to become chronic migraine or chronic daily headache? Well, one way to look at it is to ask, OK, are there conditions or medical conditions that people who have chronic migraine have more than one would expect? And it turns out there are. Um, and these are, this is not a complete list of the, the, the conditions that are what we call comorbid. comorbid means that they occur more frequently than you'd expect by chance, but it doesn't imply necessarily one is causing the other. It may, it may not, but we don't know. And there, was a, uh, there have been multiple studies looking to see, well, what are certain circumstances which would increase the risk that someone would go from every once in a while episodic migraine to become chronic migraine? And these are some of the ones that have been identified. So women are more likely for it to happen. Uh, it's clear that chronic migraine has a tendency to be associated more with lower uh, income uh, situations. Obesity, snoring, head injuries, stressful life events, overuse of painkillers, anxiety, depression, this condition allodynia, which is this uh, painful light touch, uh, having another source of disability. Uh, Frequent headaches, as I showed in the last slide, frequent headaches tend to beget e even more frequent headaches. And then there may be some genetic factors which predispose people to this. So not all of these things, for instance, genetics, are things that you, we can focus on potentially influencing or modifying. But there are some which we might be able to help. And for instance, obesity, snoring, stressful life events, uh, use of painkillers, and uh, headache frequency. So those are ones that people have now focused on to see whether or not that may make a difference. So what are the principles in terms of treating people who have chronic migraine? We have 
three major ways of addressing this, which are done at the same time and in, in parallel. The first is, what do you do to treat the symptoms when they occur? Okay, acute medications. And our mainstays for treatment are medications called triptans. Uh, Imitrex was the first one that came to the market in 1992. And over the next 10 years, an additional six of them came on the market. They're all variations on, uh, on that theme. They're, they don't work in everyone. They don't work in every attack when they do work. And they don't work immediately. But they're really a huge advance over what was available before. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications are also helpful, often in combination with triptans. So we know about ibuprofen and, uh, and uh, naproxen and uh, diclofenac. There are a number of these which are helpful. We avoid opioids and barbiturates. They make things worse. I'm going to talk more about this momentarily. But it's almost it's foundational that people who have headaches in general, but certainly people who are, have, have migraine or are prone to chronic migraine, these are to be avoided. They make things worse. So why not, you know, if the triptans work, why not take them every day if you have headaches every day? Well, it makes things worse if you do. And I'm going to talk momentarily about this. There's a condition called medication overuse headache. And the way we think about it is this, that medications which are immediate relievers are often better at keeping migraine from progressing than taking severe migraine and turning it around. And every time you take in a medication for immediate treatment, there's a, a benefit, but then there's a subtle, sometimes not so subtle penalty, which is that as they wear off, they tend to lower your threshold and make you more vulnerable to having migraine return. This ends up not being consequential if you're taking them infrequently. But over a certain frequency of use, there's kind of a tipping point. And you start to treat a condition which has helped to be promoted by the treatment itself. And then it tends to run away. And different classes of medications as painkillers are more likely to do this than others. So the opioids and the barbiturates are kind of at the top of the list. And they're almost always given in combination with things. Okay, combination medications are worse than uh, single uh, analgesics. So the threshold in general for most medications we think about no more than about eight days per month. So in addition to treating as many as eight days per month, which is not, you know, obviously the most helpful thing if you have headaches every day, you know, it's a very difficult thing as a physician to say, okay, you have pain, but don't treat that pain because you're going to make it worse. I mean, there's kind of a disconnect. But effectively, that's what happens. So how do we go about managing that? Well, there are preventive medications. So these are medications that you take every day, or in the case of Botox, you receive four times a year. And only Botox is actually FDA approved specifically for treating migraine when it becomes chronic. That is 15 or more days per month. These other medications, and there are more. This is not the complete list of preventive medicines. These are all medications which uh, are helpful. They've been proven to be helpful for treating episodic migraine. And a few of them, there are growing studies indicating that they can be helpful for chronic migraine as well, specifically topiramate. And one of the medications for high blood pressure, typically, uh, the, in the beta blocker family called atenolol. But then on top of that, and simultaneously, we make changes which end up being important, often as important as adding medications. And these are the things which I'm going to focus on now because I'm not going to be prescribing anybody any medications today. Okay? But these are things that you can do, and I, I'd like to persuade you that it actually can make an enormous difference if you make these changes alone. So migraine will let you know if you're living anything but a boring, predictable lifestyle. And most people don't really aspire to live a boring, predictable lifestyle. Nonetheless. Any kind of surprise is something which will be a, a negative surprise for you. Migraine always wins the argument. So keeping to regular meal times, regular bedtimes, regular waking hours, keep it very predictable. So meal times. Uh, I'm going to talk momentarily, keeping your weight within what is considered to be optimal weight. Okay, Being significantly overweight is a risk factor for uh, chronic migraine. Turns out being significantly underweight may be as well. So being an optimal weight is very important. There's this uh, set of habits which are called sleep hygiene. I'm going to talk about this momentarily. So keeping to ensure that you protect your sleep as a 
uh, as a critical thing which helps with your reduction in migraine. Uh, migraine doesn't occur at random times. And one of the ways it occurs in a predictable way is if you look at large populations of people, it tends to occur early in the morning into waking. And likewise, sleep is a, a very effective remedy for migraine for many people. It's been long understood to be that the case. And in particular, in children, that's the case. So sleep is actually an important thing. Finding you know, the number of hours of sleep that you should have is a very important issue. You know, it's usually between seven and a half and nine hours for adults. And if you sleep too little or sleep too late, that may provoke migraine. Eliminating overuse of painkillers, as I was talking about and as I'll show you in a moment. Protect your head. This sounds like an obvious thing, but wearing a helmet is important, but it's often not enough. I mean, there, you've probably been hearing a lot about concussions in the NFL. It's important for uh, football players to wear helmets, but you know, if you're running into something uh, as, as um, immovable as the ground at high speed, you know, a helmet's only going to do so much. And you actually don't need to have significant head trauma to worsen migraine. There are now abundant studies. There's a huge study that, that uh, was reported last year from service personnel coming back from Afghanistan and, and Iraq. And this is a paradox. This is why I'm emphasizing it. Mild traumatic brain injury, that is concussion, is far more likely to lead to chronic migraine than severe traumatic brain injury. We do not understand why that's true. But there's very good evidence that, it's, that even mild uh, head injury is, is, uh, is important. And then stress management. This is a really easy thing to talk about, but it's a very hard thing to achieve. Uh, there are well-validated studies, um, relaxation therapy, uh, a field of psychology called cognitive behavioral therapy, biofeedback therapy. These are all things which are well-established as being highly therapeutic and as therapeutic in many instances in combination as preventive medications or pharmaceuticals. And then finally, being appropriately physical, I mean, uh, exercising in an integrated way, and physical therapy itself can actually be helpful. So about body weight. So this is the percentage of the population who has chronic migraine for different weight classes. So if you, uh, if you are of normal weight, that's about one in 100. But as your weight increases using the, met, uh, the measurement called body mass index, which is a ratio of height to weight, starts to increase. And by the time you are very significantly overweight, it's uh, two and a half times the likelihood that you have chronic migraine. This study has been repeated by several different groups. And there's a suggestion. It has not yet been proven. And it's certainly very important. There's a suggestion that people who are in this category, if they lose weight, it then will be, a, be therapeutic for reducing their migraine frequency and severity. There was a very interesting uh, study looking at uh, 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 147 uh, women who had chronic migraine who were not uh, selected. They were consecutive women coming into this clinic in, uh, in uh, North Carolina and then asked about their sleep habits. And almost a universal part of having chronic migraine is having some type of disruption of sleep. So, 84% had fatigue on awakening. 80% um, of them would um, read in bed or watch TV in bed, uh, have urination uh, during the night. This doesn't mean in bed, but have to wake up to urinate. Uh, have insomnia, napping, sleeping pill usage, restless sleep, and so on, snoring. So this is not good quality sleep. And the question is, if you try to improve the quality of sleep, for people who are not complaining about their sleep. These people didn't come to the headache doctor because, oh, I have headaches and also I can't get to sleep at night. They came for their, their concern about their headache problems. If you can change the sleep pattern in these people, do you actually have a significant effect on, on their migraine? So the same group, Ann Calhoun in North Carolina, looked at about 50 women in this uh, circumstance. and. She provided uh, a list and, and mod uh, modest training for five changes in terms of sleep habits, OK? Consistent bedtime with a minimum of eight hours of sleep, typically eight hours. 
So always go to bed at the same time. Only use your bed for sleeping and sex, nothing else. In, in its most extreme forms, um, sleep doctors say you shouldn't use your bedroom for anything but that. You know, anything else you're doing, you should be in a different place. Um, use a visualization te technique to help shorten time to fall asleep. So you have to kind of imagine yourself relaxing and, and so on. There needs to be a delay between when you eat at least four hours and also when you have anything to drink of two hours before bedtime. This reduces the likelihood that you need to urinate in the middle of the night. And even if you don't wake up to urinate, there is this sense of needing to partially wake up because that's something which starts to kind of occupy your attention. And then avoid napping. There's a list of probably another 10 cardinal ways in which you can improve sleep, but she kind of focused on these five. And she took half the group uh, and she ha trained them in this way, and she took the other half and she trained them in a, a similar set of uh, instructions which have nothing to do with sleep hygiene as a comparator group. And then asked after a suitable interval, gee, did this change headache? And what she found was, this is the headache frequency over 28 days. Each group, this is the group that had the sleep training, this is the group that did not, had the other training. Each group started off with about 24 days with headaches per month. And the people who didn't receive any training really showed no change, but just Add, asking these people to make these changes, even though they had no sleep complaints at all, significantly reduced the number of days with headaches per month. So that's something that, that you don't need to see a doctor to do. <laughs> um, so this is an, uh, an example of what happens with overuse of painkillers. And it, I, I point this out because this gives you an idea of the slow motion, which sometimes increase in headaches uh, takes place over. So this is a 10-year time span. This is the number of tablets of caffeine-containing painkillers which were taken per day. And you can see gradually it, it increases and then it starts to take off after about six years. And by this point, these people, this person is having more and more days with headaches per month and uh, more and more severe days of headaches when they occur. And what you can see is that it, it's not a kind of a simple linear uh, chart, and it's not something which takes place over months to weeks or even, uh, pardon me, days to weeks or even months sometimes. It sometimes occurs over a longer time span, so long that it isn't even clear that, that he, uh, the painkillers are driving it versus the headaches are causing people to take more painkillers. So, with this, how do you know it's the painkillers that are worsening it? Well, you take the painkillers away and you see whether or not people improve, which is what happens most often. So opioids and, and barbiturates. So as I said, different painkillers have different consequences. And if you compare the likelihood of overuse of uh, Tylenol versus opioids, it's about twice as likely, not twice, 44% more likely that over a three-month span, it's going to lead to chronic migraine from episodic migraine. And it's even worse for barbiturates. So we really, too, try to avoid these. And what happens if you do take them away? Well, this was a very interesting study looking over a three-month span. These are a group of, of individuals who have chronic daily headache. It was mixed episodic, uh, chronic episodic and chronic tension type headache all of whom were using painkillers on, uh, on an overuse basis, that is more than eight days per month. They all started out with a similar uh, degree of impairment, what we call a headache index. This is where you take uh, any particular day that someone has headache and you give it a, a grade from, one to, uh, from zero to, uh, to three in terms of its severity. So if someone has a, a, a two day, it's, it's a two, and you add that to another day, which is three, three days, a five, and you, and you end up with uh, the total number of, uh, of uh, days with headaches times the severity, and then it's averaged. So on this particular way that, uh, scale, all of the people entered into the study had approximately the same frequency and severity of headaches. And then this group, was just watched, that were they, were they, I'm not sure whether they watched or they just refused to do anything. It could have been either, I'm not sure. But they didn't really improve over time. 
This group may stop their painkillers, or if they were on a preventive medication, that preventive medication, which clearly hadn't been working, was not changed. So this is the benefit you get by just getting rid of the painkillers alone. But if you stop the painkillers and you add a, a preventive medication, or you change it from one that isn't working, it's clearly a huge difference. So you have to ask, uh, which group do you prefer to be in? And Stopping the painkillers is the key to making all the difference, and it's extremely challenging to do because most of the time, by the time people get to the point where they're taking analgesics on a regular basis, they come to believe it's the only thing that's keeping them out of pain. And on a short-term basis, a matter of hours, that's true. On a long-term basis, it's led you into a cul-de-sac. It's led you into a spot where things aren't going to get better until you take them away, but everybody has this grave fear that taking them away is going to make things unbearable. But it's the way out. Getting rid of the painkillers is the way out. It's counterintuitive. It doesn't make sense when, when you're in it. But it's only when you, uh, you see these kinds of studies and see what, people, what happens to people when they can get away from it that it becomes more obvious. So what about Botox? I'm not going to talk at length about it, but because it is the only FDA-approved product for this, it's important that I give you some information about it. Uh, so it seems kind of uh, crazy. I mean, Botox is the stuff that you know, removes wrinkles and gets all the, the airplay you know, and, and lots of jokes. It's the same stuff. You know? it's, it's a toxin. It's a substance which a certain type of bacterium creates and releases and leads to weakening and paralysis of muscles. And if you have that infection with that bacterium and you have enough of that toxin circulating, it leads to paralysis and death. This is the same toxin without the bacterium and injected at incredibly small amounts. So small, in fact, that it's not measured in weight. It's measured in activity, okay? So it's, it, it's, um, when you look at the vial that has Botox before you put the saline in to dilute it, there's nothing to see, okay? There's nothing in there to see. So it's injected in 31 different sites. Each site is two drops of fluid, one-tenth of a milliliter. You get these injections every three months when it's, when it's effective. It literally takes five to ten minutes to do the injections. It's not uh, a very involved procedure. We don't know how it works. There's lots of speculation, lots of uh, kind of hand-waving to try to explain it. It probably does not have anything to do with muscle paralysis, even though it will temporarily weaken the muscles that it's injected into. So people who receive the injections, for instance, along in the facial region here, will show a reduction in wrinkles. It's characteristic. So what are the data? There, I'm not going to get into great deal of details about this, but the two large trials which led to FDA approval started out with uh, two groups, those that got the toxin and those that got the uh, saline injections. And they both started out with about 20 days per month. And at the end of uh, 24 weeks, the people who got the toxin, it had been reduced down to 11 and a half days with headaches uh, over that time, over 28 days, that's four weeks' time, and the placebo down to 13. So there was a substantial decrease in the people who received the saline injections, but this was significant enough difference that the FDA led to approval. So what about this issue about new daily persistent headache? This is really a, a matter of people who often have either migraine or, or uh, tension-type headache, which they're not having these headaches at all, and all of a sudden, within a week's time, they're having them on a daily basis. It's very, very dramatic. It's characteristic of new daily persistent headache that people are able to say, yes, I know when it was. It was, it was April 5th. I remember where I was when it started, and it hasn't stopped. That, that's the story that people have. It's a, kind of a a riveting story. It tends to be more women than men. Uh, they tend to be younger. Uh, this is around the time that migraine first appears 
the peak onset of migraine tends to be late teens and early 20s. It's more bilateral than on one side, tends to be moderate to severe, tends to be constant. It may have migraine features. So distinguishing it from migraine versus this is all based upon its onset. Uh, and it's probably more common in kids than adults. So why do we even mention this? Maybe it's just, you know, well, sometimes migraine just kind of starts out of the blue. <clears throat> the reason is that sometimes it's more difficult to for it to respond to the things that migraine typically responds to. And there's a growing sense that this actually may be a secondary headache. There may be something that we have not detected yet, which is more likely to bring it on. So there are subgroups who have this who may have had some type of a viral illness or you know, seem to have a, a cold or whatever within the couple of weeks before it starts. We don't really know. It's only really been first described about a decade ago. But it's one of these situations where over the next 10 years, I think we're going to learn much more about it. What about cluster headache? So cluster headache uh, demands respect. I mean, all these things demand respect. But if someone actually has cluster headache, from now on, bear in mind that this is the most severe pain that humans can experience. I know that sounds like, like a huge exaggeration. But every uh, circumstance where I've heard of someone having cluster headache who has also had another kind of pain, which is a comparator, has always said that cluster headache is in a different category. Okay? I had a patient who came to see me. This was several years ago <clears throat> with cluster headache who uh, about a month later developed a, uh, an infection in his, in his, in his abdomen. And as a part of the, I hope this doesn't disturb too many people. I'm going to have to watch. As a part of the, the therapy, it was important to have uh, uh, the wound that was opened remain open so that it could be clean on a regular basis. Now, you can imagine how, uh, how painful it is to have an open wound for days. And on the continuum of smiley to frowny face that he got every day about how severe his pain was, he kept pointing in the middle. And the surgeon came by every, every day and said, look, you know, you know, we're all guys here. You, know, you don't have to, you know, we know it's painful. He said, no, 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 cluster headache is out there. Okay? And I've had at least three patients, women who have had cluster headache, who have delivered children with no anesthetic, who have told me independently that they prefer to do that every day than ever have cluster headache again. I mean, it's really, it's, it's just a profound thing. So these are excruciating events. But mercifully, they're not as long as migraine. And they're typically less than an hour, more like around 45 minutes. And it's not rare. You know, it's usually thought to be rare, but it's about a half a million Americans have this. Uh, about 10% of them, 50,000 Americans, probably have a chronic form where it occurs on a daily basis, if you can imagine that. So half a million Americans, that's about the same prevalence as multiple sclerosis in the country. And everybody's heard of MS. If you look, and this is again editorial, I have to kind of like tell you what I'm editorializing too much. If you ask how much funding has the National Institutes of Health directed towards multiple sclerosis over the last decade, they've directed about $1.9 billion towards research. And I think that's great. You know, I don't begrudge it at all. It's appropriate and it's been necessary. But if you ask how much funding the NIH has directed to cluster headache over the last 25 years, two and a half times the time span, it's less than $2 million. Okay? So it's 1,000 times more over that shorter time span. It's invisible. It's just not, not taken seriously at all by NIH. So this is mostly men, whereas migraine is mostly women. The average age of onset is about 30. And it has this unusual characteristic that occurs on a daily basis for a period of time, typically a couple of months, and then it disappears. And it may come back the next year at the same time each year or you know, every six months for a period of time. And when it occurs, it occurs typically at the same time each day. People can sometimes seem to set their clock by it. And it's often awakening people from sleep. It also is associated with uh, several uh, autonomic changes. So people may have on the same side as the pain, the eye may tear and the eyelid may droop and the pupil may be small. 
and there may be nasal congestion, and that'll all occur during the attack. And there are some therapies which are very effective, but they're not universally effective. So oxygen and sumatriptan, which is one of these triptan medications for migraine, when given as an injection, it's often very helpful. And there are medicines which can be taken on a daily basis, which are often able to suppress this. But they're not perfect. They don't work in everybody. And in chronic forms of the disorder, it's really a, a, a huge, huge problem. So then there's another disorder that can be a chronic daily disorder, which also has a, an unusual timing. And this one is actually uh, colloquially called the alarm clock headache. So this is a, a quite a rare disorder. Uh, this one's mostly women. And mostly women, whereas cluster headache is around onset age 30, this is rarely before about age 60. It's about age 60 when it comes on. These are relatively shorter duration events, again, like cluster headache. <clears throat> they're moderate to severe, sometimes with nausea. And they're strictly associated with this particular time of day. So between 2 and 4 in the morning, they come on. And people will wake up to the pain, and they'll look at the clock, and it's always like 2.12. You know, it's just an amazing thing. And people always report that, saying, I can't believe it. It's always at the same time. And this also does respond about two-thirds of the time to some medications like lithium or topiramate. Or uh, I cautioned you about uh, caffeine. You know, caffeine is a painkiller. I didn't actually mention this too much. But caffeine, in this context, for migraine, that, that context, is another painkiller. Okay? Caffeine has lots of different things that, that uh, it's attributed to have, uh, such as it makes people feel more awake and have more energy. But one of the other things that it can do is that it's a painkiller, uh, not a very potent one, but it shares with other analgesics that it can sensitize the brain to lead to chronic migraine. And most people regard caffeine as just part of a beverage and it's part of all of our social life. But for people who have migraine, it really should be avoided. It should be respected as just another painkiller. Well, this disorder, hypnic headache, actually it can be therapeutic. We don't know why. And then finally, one last chronic headache disorder, which is again a rare disorder, uh, is something called hemicrania continua. And I think it's basically a rule of thumb that if a doctor uses Latin, they're trying to obscure something. So, so hemicrania continua is just a headache which occurs on the same side all the time and doesn't go away while people are awake, OK? So it's about 2 thirds are women. Average age of onset is young again. And it's always on the same side. It's moderate pain with kind of periods of time up to a half an hour where it may become severe, and then it drops back down to this background. And it's continuous. As long as someone's awake, there's always this pain there. And it doesn't have pain-free intervals. It can also be associated with some of these so-called autonomic findings. So on the same side of the head, there may be bloodshot eyes or uh, tearing, nasal congestion with drainage into the nose, eyelid drooping, unequal pupils. And the reason this one is important to recognize is that there is a medicine which always works. And how do I know it always works? Because you can't have hemicrania continuum if it doesn't work. It's in the definition. <laughs> it's very circular. I didn't write the definition. but. Hemicrania continua is axiomatically responsive to this medication. So indomethacin is the medication. It's in the big family that are called the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medicines that includes ibuprofen. But there's something special about indomethacin that we don't quite understand. So that's our tour. So chronic headaches, they're just more common than most people realize. They're probably more common in this room than most places. Um, they have many different forms, although chronic migraine and tension type headache and that continuum really are the, the gorilla in the room. Uh, they are disabling often, uh, but they're treatable. So I'll answer questions. That's it. Thank you. Yes. Causes. Well, yeah, so that's an entirely, first of all, it's a huge lecture, but a lot of the lecture is going to be um, hand waving because we don't know anywhere near as much as we need to know about it. I could give a long lecture about what we know about the, uh, the causes of migraine, what's going on in the brain with migraine. Uh, 
and we know quite a bit about the genetics. Uh, we actually were uh, contributors to identifying one of the new genes for migraine recently. Uh, there are, depending on how you count them, there are about two dozen genes which have been identified which influence migraine. But we don't really understand what are all the things that go on in the brain which make it more likely for migraine to occur. We understand that during migraine aura, there is a wave which occurs which passes across the surface of the brain, a wave of increased ac uh, activity or excitation, and then in its wake behind it, that part of the brain which had been excited then becomes uh, quieter. It's, it's, it's less able for that part of the brain to become active. And we know that the aura is associated with that. It's been seen on imaging studies and lots of other animal studies that that's the case. How that links to the, um, the, the creation of the pain is one of the puzzles that we don't know enough about. We know that uh, part of the pain generation is related to uh, sensitivity of certain of the blood vessels which surround the brain and the coverings of the brain called the, the meninges and certain nerves which uh, the brain uses to detect what's going on in those blood vessels and that's an important area that gets, that gets involved. But a lot of the other details are really you know, a work in progress. We're doing research here uh, to try to understand some of those things. Some of our, my colleagues are in, in the back um, trying to identify particular substances which we think are important in, uh, in making people more likely to develop chronic migraine. And there are certain brain substances which we are looking for, for instance, in blood and saliva to try to identify that. So it's, it's, that was like a five minute description of something which should be taking more like five hours. But anyway, yes. The answer, so the answer is, across the United States, the prevalence is about the same. Across the globe, there are some differences. So we don't really understand why, but in Africa, it's slightly less prevalent. In certain parts of East Asia, it's slightly less prevalent. But in general, it's pretty close across the, the, the globe. Some people are particularly sensitive to, uh, for instance, weather changes. And there's very good evidence that uh, from several studies that uh, migraine can be pro provoked by certain changes in the weather. So moving to places like Arizona where there aren't changes in the weather as much for some people is, is therapeutic. Uh, I'm not suggesting moving. I don't think that will help, <laughs> actually. Yes? Um, yeah. Right, so I didn't talk about that, and uh, maybe I should have. It's more applicable really to episodic migraine than to chronic migraine typically, or chronic daily headache. <clears throat> People often talk about migraine triggers in diet, in the, in the environment, so um, perfumes and odorants may provoke migraine. <clears throat> There's been a lot written, and most people who have migraine will have a strong conviction that this substance or that food will provoke my migraine. The problem is that part of the individuality about migraine is that it's been very difficult to come up with studies which prove that this substance versus that is actually going to put you at greater risk to have migraine or tr trigger migraine. The substances which um, there's some consensus about include monosodium glutamate, nitrates or nitrites, alcohol, uh, medications and some foods that uh, are estrogen containing. Okay. And when you get beyond that, almost anything edible, someone has had a conviction, has been able to trigger their migraine. Some things are more often described than others, like red wine or cheeses or nuts and things like that. It's been my experience, though, that when, so if you'd asked me that question 15 years ago, I would have had a long list to say, okay, eliminate these things and come back. Not just do that, but you, that was one of the things to be on the list. And I found that it ended up not being very helpful. And it ended up leading to um, some unintended consequences. So the unintended consequences, if you start to believe that anything you eat is toxic, uh, 
or if you can't keep yourself from eating it, and, and as I showed you, obesity is an important part of this whole equation, that you are actually contributing and can, you know, uh, to why you remain sick, then it leads to a whole lot of uh, uh, unfortunate uh, senses of self that we try to avoid. And it can actually lead to some, uh, some changes in, in uh, eating disorders and things like that. I just found that it wasn't helpful to do that. With episodic migraine, more so than chronic migraine. So with some, someone comes to me, when they're having you know, three to six days with headaches per month, what I might say is, okay, for the next three dozen attacks, write down everything you'd eaten during, for the 24 hours before the attack. And if something comes up on that list, uh, which is not something you typically eat, okay, it's not in your diet all the time, then maybe give some consideration to that being a, a concern. You know, the other, the other obvious thing to eliminate is what I mentioned earlier, which is caffeine, which is almost always overlooked. Um, but apart from that, it's just not been helpful. You know, whereas if you, there are a lot of uh, popular books which will go into great detail about all the things that you should be eliminating. And I, I, it just has not been my experience that that's been um, a, 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 the best way to go, anyway, for me. Any other questions? Yes. You had mentioned that uh, Botox was FDA approved. Are there any other treatments in the pipeline that we should expect to see? For chronic migraine, um, there's one other uh, treatment that's actually an early phase trial. So right now there are 25 products which are in some, uh, some part of the, uh, the pipeline of clinical trials. Clinical trials have three different phases. The first phase is where the drug is tested in people who don't have any illness to see how it's metabolized and broken down by the body. You know, the, the second phase is where people are tested who have the condition just to see what the dose ought to be. And then the, the big trials are the phase three trials where they decide whether or not it's safe and effective. None of these 25 products are, uh, are beyond the, the phase two trials. And there, most of them are not even in the phase two trials. But the one new class of medications that is being, there are three different companies which are looking into this, are um, their antibodies. They're uh, substances which block the, their proteins that block the action of uh, a molecule which has been found to be um, involved in migraine called CGRP. So they either attach to the CGRP or they attach to the place the CGRP is intended to go called the CGRP receptor to block its actions there. And these uh, medications, they're not really, at this point they're compounds because we haven't proven they can medicate anything. But uh, these compounds are in very early uh, trials, which means they won't be available for a minimum of uh, five years. It might be longer than that. Uh, of the 25 medications that, or compounds that are in clinical studies, 15 of them are reworking of a medication which has already been, uh, been approved for either migraine in a different form, in other words, through a different route to deliver it, or a medication which is approved for some other purpose which is now being tested for, for migraine. So what that means is that there are 10 new compounds that, or two, 10 new drugs that, uh, that have not yet been, uh, been found to be effective for anything. Uh, and uh, I'd love to tell you that that's a lot, because <laughs> it isn't. And I'd love to tell you that having 10 there means that it's likely that uh, a number of these will become FDA approved, but that's not the case either. The, the likelihood of medications uh, dying in clinical trials is very high. The, the success rate is very low. So we need to increase the... Uh, the amount of research that's done. And most people say, well, isn't that the job of the drug companies to do that? Well, if you look at all of the new compounds, that is things which have not been approved for any other purpose, which end up getting approved for treating any kind of disease, they're called new molecular entities. And you ask, of those that end up getting approved, what percentage of them started out as research that's publicly funded from the NIH or some other public funding agency rather than drug companies, it's about three quarters of them. So without NIH funding for migraine research, 
people who have migraine are significantly further handicapped that the likelihood there'll be new drugs for migraine is extremely low. That's why we go to Washington every year for the last six years. Uh, you all, as Vermonters, can be actually justifiably extremely proud that our congressional delegation are by far the people who have been most responsive to try to uh, increase NIH funding for this disorder. Uh, it's, it's an important thing. So, yes? Why do people with saline get better? That seems to get better. Yeah. So well, the yeah, so um, you probably all have heard of something called the placebo effect, okay? So the placebo effect is um, a therapeutic uh, effect which occurs uh, as a consequence of uh, combination of uh, belief systems and ritual and, uh, and, and hope. And, and, pardon me? I think also that perhaps it's like damage to the wells. That can make the point for the gesture, for pain management. You're probably familiar with No, I don't. I'm sorry. Well, it, it probably was not um, due to trigger point injections because in, in, uh, something I didn't mention in the trial is that there, were, uh, there was a certain amount of leeway that investigators in the trial were given to distribute the uh, injections in addition. And what they did was they did something that called follow the pain. So in addition to the 31 sites, they were given leeway to add a few more sites. And in the further analysis of the people who did, had the follow the pain versus the people who did not have follow the pain, there didn't seem to be any further improvement. So that's not great evidence about this, but the, the, the fact is we don't understand why, why that works. Um, but it's also important that most people, when they hear the term placebo re, uh, response, they, it's usually given in some kind of a disparaging, sneery way. And you should understand that the placebo response is actually a critical way that we reduce our pain and reduce our perception of things in general. Uh, it's a necessary part of any painkiller. Every painkiller taps into the same mechanisms. So for instance, for opioid medicines, there's a specific medication which can block the receptor for opioids, or natural opioids in the brain. And that blocker is called naloxone. And there, one of the early studies kind of that pointed out how important the placebo response is, uh, this was about 25 years ago, showed that the reduction in pain from the placebo response could be blocked by the same molecule which can block opioid-related pain relief. It's the same mechanism. And so it's not that, oh, it's one versus the other. It's all part of the same. So I don't begrudge the fact that the saline was helpful. I would just like to find stuff which is better than what <laughs> Botox does, you know. And I'm happy that it does as much as it does do. Yes? Have you heard of the Atkins diet? Atkins diet, yes. No, I've never heard that that's been, um, been shown to have any benefit for that, no. Yes? In the adolescent girl, Pardon? An adolescent girl, like 15 years old, yes. who had uh, chronic, very chronic migraine for four or five years. Is there any indication that time will change that? Is there some chance of improving that? So I, what I didn't do is show you what the, um, the natural history of episodic migraine is. Um, 
So if you look at, at the course over a lifetime for populations of people who have episodic migraine, the peak time of onset tends to be uh, late adolescence into early 20s, and the peak uh, prevalence, that is the percentage of maximum pr uh, percentage for any given age, tends to be into the 30s into 40s. And then after that, it tends to fall. So for instance, girls who are you know, below age 10 have approximately the same prevalence as women who are above age 80 in terms of migraine. So that's this big peak. If you were to choose any one individual out of the large group of people who, whose information went into making that graph, you wouldn't be able to say, OK, yours is going to get better here versus there. There's enough variability from one person to another that all you can do is say, well, here's what we see if we look at large groups of people. And sometimes the things that keep migraine frequent are related to the sorts of uh, modifiable things that we that I mentioned. For chronic, it's clear that, um, that it's more frequent in, in women than men, but this, uh, this peak is not quite as dramatic in terms of it getting better with time. It is clear, I emphasized, okay, that 3% of that group <clears throat> who had episodic migraine will go to chronic migraine over a year. Likewise, there's a certain uh, fraction of people who have chronic migraine who will get better over time. We don't, we don't know exactly what it is that helps foster that apart from the sorts of uh, uh, suggested changes I mentioned. Anybody else? Yes? Uh, any evidence for uh, nutritional supplements? Or yeah, so, so there are several different substances which have been this is, again, for episodic migraine. It's not something which has been studied at all for chronic migraine. There are multiple substances which are uh, given at very high dosages, uh, so high that they're really not um, replacing um, a deficit. They're providing a, a huge supplement or surfeit. Uh, and on that list are uh, magnesium at very high doses, a, a B vitamin called riboflavin, vitamin B2 at very high doses, uh, a substance which is uh, necessary for the parts of the cells, which called mitochondria, which are important for energy, called the coenzyme Q10 at very high doses. Um, and then there are uh, a couple of herbs, neither of which I, all, I, w I would even bother to recommend. One's called butterbur, and the other one's called feverfew. And they're very much full of impurities, and so it's hard to know what you're really recommending. So all of those in some studies, controlled studies, have shown benefit. But the same issues arise in terms of uh, not everybody responds. It takes time for the responses noticed. They're not cheap often, and insurance doesn't pay for them. Most of these things you have to take two or three times a day, uh, which is very difficult for most people to do. And finally, if you're taking something which is 200 times the US recommended daily requirement, it's a drug. It's not, it's not a vitamin supplement. It's, you should see it as just another drug. Yes? Well, that's all part. There are many different modalities that people looked at in terms of relaxation training and the like. And uh, I can't uh, speak to. Uh, I mean, there are many kinds of meditation as well, so I, I, I don't want to uh, speak out of turn. So I, I can't uh, cite a specific study with a particular uh, form of meditation, but the same sorts of relaxation training and cognitive behavioral therapy are, is really a form of meditation that most people would regard. And it's clear that, that it helps. It's, it's often very helpful. So, Any other questions? Yes? Uh, just a minor question. Uh, you mentioned that some people report that weather changes might cause migraine. Yes. Have you gotten any more specific data? I'm wondering, I've heard possibly there are metric pressure changes. Yeah, so people have tried to look at that. There was a really interesting study in, <clears throat> in Calgary, Alberta. And in the wintertime in Calgary, uh, 
uh, there's a, they call it a warm wind, but Calgary in the wintertime, it's a warmer wind um, called the Chinook winds. And the Chinook winds kind of come off the mountains and they kind of change the weather patterns. And there's kind of a folklore in that area that it brings ill health, and in particular, it brings headaches. So the group of headache doctors in that area did a, a survey of people in their practice who had headaches. Um, and they had a lot of questions. And one of them is, OK, you know, keep a chart and mark down what is your best guess about whether or not you're going to have a headache tomorrow. And that was the only thing they were really interested in. And what they found was that a significant percentage of people in Calgary who have headaches could predict tomorrow's Chinook winds better than the weather service. <laughs> no one knows why that's true. We really just don't know. There have been a lot of people who have speculated that barometric pressure could be it. It's not known. But what it speaks to, the fact that th these sorts of things happen, uh, is that we probably really should rethink about whether the, the issue about whether migraine is a disease at all. When you have something which is highly prevalent and something which occurs in upwards of one in five Americans this year is really prevalent. And when it occurs, it changes behavior very dramatically. And it occurs in young people, particularly young women. And it's heritable. If you add all those things together, you have, you have the proposal that there may be a selective advantage for migraine to have been around, maybe not today, but maybe earlier on in our evolution, which provided some favorable advantage to us to have women change their behavior at the time of their periods or early in the morning so that they were interacting less. And when you see that sort of thing, it's not that I have any less motivation to get rid of it, but it means that it's probably entrenched here and it's a significant part of what it, you know, what has happened in terms of humans to evolve to what, where we are. So it's probably not going to go quietly <laughs> in terms of trying to remove it. Um, any other questions? Yes. Um, I, study, I, I cited it because I think it's significant. Secondly, it is easy to understand. Thirdly, in this setting, it's the sort of thing as a take-home message, which I think could be helpful. It has not been replicated. It needs, I mean, there are several ways in which the study could be enlarged and improved upon. But I think that it was done uh, with great care, given the modest size of the study, by a very, very careful investigator. So I believe her data quite well. Uh, and I think it's an important message because that's the only change that was made. And, and uh, you know, one of the criticisms of the study, just to give you an idea about how we think about these kinds of studies, is that the same people who did the training for the sleep issues were the people who did the training for the other thing. So we can potentially, you know, provide subtle cues which investigators themselves may not be aware of to tip off people that this is, you know, the preferred thing to do. But even allowing for that, it's a, it's a pretty large uh, treatment effect for a relatively small sample. So, all right. Thank you very much. <laughs>